In this video, I'm going to take you through accounting for investments held in multiple currencies and show you how the accounting works and also how we generate some reports using a new tool called Robust. So this uses Excel as the base and um, generates a full set of reports, including balance sheet, profit and loss, cash flow and investment statement. It's really a prototype at this stage, but I'm going to take you through nonetheless and show you how it works. So just going over the topic space, we'll be looking at currency gains and losses, investment gains and losses and how those work, uh, mark to market versus cost, uh, restoring the symmetry to foreign currency accounting, and we'll show you that in the actual tool, and then finally generating the reports and doing the cross checks on those reports. Just so we're all on the same page, let's have a look at a currency gain. So let's assume we've got 100 US dollars and we measure that 100 US dollars on the 1st of the 7th, 2019, 1st of July. And that would, if we were to convert that to our reporting currency, which is AUD, we end up with 142 Aussie dollars. We do the same calculation at the 30th of the 6th, 2020, assuming the currency has gone uh, down in value from a, an AUD perspective. And now you can see we have uh, we have more Aussie dollars. So the gain is very simply the difference between what it was at that point and what it was at this point. Now let's just assume that we have a USD investment. Now the investment itself may be shares, maybe Tesla shares, and in the same style we start with a hundred dollars but because there's a gain in the investment that's a capital gain right there's a ten dollar usd capital gain but once we factor in the aud again we can see that there's a there's a change in the aud value but some of that will be a capital gain and so there's a total gain of 26 dollars and 37 cents now some of that is the investment gain we can factor that by no because we know that the gain is 10 USD and that yeah, that investment gain will then be $15.38 Aussie. Now we can then see what the currency gain is. So the underlying currency gain, because the currency uh, gain is going to be the same um, just on that original USD investment amount, not on the capital gain component, but just on the currency amount and we get to 1099. So We've got an overall gain of 2637, which therefore shows you that there's two components to that gain. There's the investment gain and then there, so investment gain and currency gain. Now let's dive into the actual tool. So the way that Robust works is it consumes bank statements as the input, and it also consumes a few other pieces of information, which I'll take you through. So here's an example of a bank statement. And in this example, we've got two very simple bank or three very simple bank statements. Our first very simple bank statement is what we call a quasi bank. It's not a real bank. It's just an opportunity to bring in some investments that were brought in, I guess, invested in before the bank, the bank accounts that we currently have. So some historical records and the way that we do this is we set it up as a bank account but we show money going so essentially invest in and that's the investment into unilever with the number of units so that's the number of units and the dollar value in this case not a dollar value it's the euro value we've got siemens axa and bmw all euro denominated investments and euro denominated companies i suppose or euro companies so we've got the date the euro values and then we're simply saying well we're putting the equivalent euros in to fund the purchase of the investment and then on uh, on the same or along the same line of thinking we've got bank statements which are real bank statements and in this case we can see an introduction of capital into the bank account and then money coming out of the bank to invest in so you can see the description here on the left is driven by what we call action verbs 
and those action verbs are linked to the actual accounts. So in the case of investing, you've got invest in and dispose of, and those are both related to financial investments. And then we've got a couple of other action verbs down here, which you'll see in action. And we have those just very simply accounting, proprietor drawings and bank charges. And those are, so these are AUD transactions. And then we've got Euro transactions over here, which I just went through. Now we also keep track of the unit types. So you've seen those, we've, we've got four different investment types. We've also got unit values. If you want to mark to market, if you want to see what the market value of these things is at certain points in time, well, you're going to need to recognize market value. So we need market value at the start of a financial reporting time frame. So in this case, we've got a reporting time frame which is 1 July 20 to 30 June 21. And we've got our we've got our unit values. So the day before, which is 36 2020, and that will essentially give us the opening market and that's the closing market. And that's pretty much all we need. So let's just save off on that report. So save off on that report using just Excel save. Um, and now what I'll do is actually show you loading up those uh, or importing those reports. So let's just go along to our OneDrive. This is how we do it. We upload the file into OneDrive. I've got my test file. I'm uploading, I'm just going to write over the top of what's already there. That's uploaded. And then I will come along and I actually need to pull this out of my, so my OneDrive Explorer. See, this is just a, this is a plugin, I suppose, that we've, that we've got working here. See the endpoint URL and that robust test file sitting inside there. It's that Excel file. It'll call an endpoint to generate the reports. So we'll invoke robust on that now. And if we see what's happening down here, well, this is actually showing the system in, in progress. It runs as a job or a batch. So we batch process the whole data set. And in this example, the data set is rather simple, but um, I will show you just now a more complex data set with significantly more transactions and bank accounts just just to give you a sense that this thing will actually process across the top of a whole lot more data than what i'm showing you here um, there you go so that processed and this is what we set, uh, essentially get as an output we get all these reports and they come out in a number of formats but for humans we're probably only interested in um, let's just go through them. Probably the starting point is to go back and have a look at what we had in the sheet. So what did we have? We had the initial investments, which is Unilever, Siemens, AXA, and BMW. Um, these are the unit, uh, unit amounts, numbers of units, and the euro amount, as I mentioned. And then we had some more transactions. We did some more investing in the current time frame. Oh no, these will be before the current time frame. Only this one is the purchased in the current time frame. And then we've got these sales in the current time frame. So we've got four four batches of sales and a single purchase in the current time frame. So let's go back and look at the investment report that's popped out. So where's our investment report? And you can see as I mentioned, we've got one purchase in the current time frame. Now this is probably a little blocky and difficult to decipher, but let me take you through because essentially what we're doing is providing all the granular detail around um, all of the information that's necessary. So you can see that, that that was the one purchase here. It does the conversion, shows you what the converted value is, shows, shows you the unit, uh, what the foreign currency value is in the, in the foreign currency, the number of units. So those were purchased. Um, whatever was there is the opening opening market values same kind of concepts 
any sale that took place. And I mentioned there were four sales in that time frame, so you can see those getting sold out of. And as soon as as soon as there is a sale, it breaks the batch down. So you can see three lots of AXA here because there's one. There was one new purchase of AXA, which took place later on, as in later on after the very initial investment. So there was the very initial investment in AXA back in 15. And then we've got another investment in AXA there. But when we have a look over here, you can see it breaks it into three parts because it's actually using a first in first out. So that first 50 is coming off of that very first batch. I think it must have been the first batch must have been 1250. So let's just double check that we had 1250 as our very first AXA batch. Yeah, there you go 1250 AXA, because it's sort of chopped off when I've said that I've sold 50, it's chopped it off that first block. But at least it leaves that remaining block there because that remaining block of AXA still has a closing market value. So there's a closing market value of AXA on what was left after the sale. And then there's the more recent purchase of an additional 50. So you can see what it's essentially doing is it's giving us our it's giving us our closing market values in AUD and the initial currency of interest. And then it is giving us any realized gains. And as, as I went through with the demo uh, on the Excel sheet, you can see it's giving us the gain. So the realized market gain in two pieces. It's giving us the realized market gain component. The actual market gain of the investment has moved. But then there's also been a, a realized Forex gain which in this case is a loss and then for any of those un any of those assets still on hand we've now got the equivalent unrealized market gain and it will show us that in the in the foreign currency and then when it shows us that in the AUD it's again giving us the market gain converted it's the actual market value of the gain or loss and then also the Forex component because there's a Forex component as well. So just to see how these are working, let's just um, probably the easiest way for me to do this is I'll go back and then just open this in a new tab and also open a balance sheet because I want to show you how this sort of cross references across to the balance sheet. So final balance sheet. Okay, and we had that investment sheet. And what we would be doing is making sure that we've got a cross reference across these investments. Don't forget this is mark to market. So 56117869 for a total investment of 1,312,000. And so if we go down and look for our 1,312,000, um, where are we finding that? Oh no, that's, so that, that won't be the, so financial investments, 1312. Yes, we should find 1312 there as the total AUD mark to market. And on hand, at cost foreign. So closing market, one there, there we go, there it is. So that's the closing total market value converted to AUD, 1312. And then what we would be looking for as well is we would be looking for our um, realized gains, but these will be in the profit and loss. So let's go back. So we've seen where this comes from. We go back and let's open up a final profit and loss. And what we would hope to find in here is our so. There's going to be the currency. There's going to be the currency movements on the actual bank account. There's only that one bank account, so there's currency movement on that. But then there's also the uh, income realized without the currency movement. And so 
flow. In investment income realized without currency movement, 11116. There's that 11116. There's the realized. So then the next number down is the 944, which is the investment income realized only currency movement. There's that realized Forex gain on the investment report. And then if we went down to the unrealized, we've got the investment income unrealized without the currency movement, 440, 440,000. So there's that 440,000, that's the market value and the unrealized Forex gain minus 38. So if we went down here, we find that minus 38. So you can see where our comprehensive income is coming from. Obviously, there's also the, we haven't got any interest in there, but we've got our bank charges. And these were all done in AUD initially anyway, because the, um, the transaction set over here, and we only had the expenses in AUD. So that was the five. There were some drawings in there, which is not an expense. That's going to go through the balance sheet. And we would hope that if we had a look at our balance sheet, we'd have a current, we have a um, current time frame income of three hundred and eighty-eight thousand. So let's go back out to that balance sheet so that I can show you. Uh, so final balance sheet. So there is our three hundred and eighty-eight, which is our current earnings. But don't forget, of course, we've got historical earnings of 468,000. And that's, uh, that's the gains that have taken place before the time frame in question. So what would those gains be? Those would be the current, the for, I'm assuming those would be currency gains. Uh, let's have a look because we need to pull out, we need to pull out our profit and loss which would be for the time frame, the historical time frame. Let's see. So we've got some currency movements on the bank account. And then we've got these currency movements. Oh, we've got, oh yes, because it's, it's not just the currency movements, it's also the, under, the underlying assets have moved, but in the historical context, anything before the opening date of our report. So there were gains that were made in that time frame. So historical time frame, and you can see those being generated there. Now, we've also got the cash flow statement. If I dive into the cash flow statement, don't forget again, it's only going to be in, it's only going to be reflected within the time frame that we're looking at. So the way that this works is it works bank by bank because we wanted to keep a, an eye on what's actually happening. So we can see the contribution of capital, so increases and decreases. The drawings, I don't know if this is probably quite right, financing and investing activities, but needless to say, you've got movements that are taking place through here. Operating, yes, there's your operating decreases, which is the bank, and you get to a closing bank balance, 484,720. We saw that pretty much. We didn't have an opening balance, but everything happened through, so within within our time frame, right? And if we checked out, so we would find that that balance there is equal to that minus the sum of these values. And we've got four, 484,720. So 484,720. And then we've got the same thing happening with, uh, with our Euro bank. These are converted values though, because of course this is an AUD report. And you can see we're going um, again, the decreasing and increasing adjustments with whatever's moving through that bank account to a final closing euro value, 200,224. 200,224. Right, so that's our cash flow. Now, of course, you could rebuild this cash flow in another, in another more sort of traditional approach where you wouldn't see it bank by bank in granular detail, but at least the way we've put it together here gives you some kind of, you know, it gives you a feel for what's actually happening. Now, finally, what we would have a look at is our general ledger. So let's have a look at our general ledger viewer here in the HTML. 
And this is where you could dive into the actual granular detail. Notice all the accounts are active. So you'd want to, you'd want to filter this probably to look at it in more detail. Oh, sorry, uh, look at it um, more concisely if you wanted to look just at say one account. But here we go. So we've got the Euro transactions moving through what I believe is, we looked at the very first account up here. We've probably got, uh, we probably have, oh, we've got the CBA bank and then we've got the Euro bank. So that must be, um, or maybe it's not showing it in that, for, in that sequence. But the way to do it, to see it in sequence is just untick it at the root. Let's have a look at the CBA bank. There's our CBA bank. You can see there's no Forex adjustments taking place on that. But if we looked at the Euro bank, we will find that, um, we will find that there are vector converted. So you can see here, there's a conversion at the transaction date, and then another conversion at the, at the report date at balance date. Maybe that is the, is that? Yep. So I'm thinking that we don't, let's just have a look and see what we can see in the actual currency change. And if we went to currency on the Euro bank, we can see any currency adjustments transpiring through and the currency adjustments will be in two parts. There'll be a, a before and after. So when I say a before and after, um, before the opening balance date, and then the after balance date. And there's a small adjustment here, which I think is related to the um, opening and closing of the days relative to the Forex uh, API endpoint that we use, which can be a few cents, but essentially you can see this approach that we're using follows the foreign currency accounting using um, uh, using this method where we where we restore the symmetry, and that is whereby, and I'll I'll just show you the AP, uh, the URL if you want to come and investigate this further. So you can come and have a look at that URL and read up on this in more detail. But, but there's two methods. Um, the official solution for, for translating currency is you keep all your records in, you create, create records in the underlying reporting currency at every transaction. Or there's this other method, which is about restoring the symmetry to the foreign currency accounting, where all of your transactions are maintained in the original transaction set, which is ex exactly what we're doing here. So everything is maintained in, so we don't do the conversion here. You can see that the currencies are maintained in their native currency format. And then it's only at runtime that we're generating um, the currency gain or loss based on the, um, Let's just generate out that GL detail where you can see you've got the, the gain before and the gain after or the gain and gains and losses before and after the date time of the opening balance, bearing in mind that there's quite a bit of time that's, uh, that's involved again, some of those transactions before the 1st of July. 2020, right? So if we have a look at our report details, 1st July 2020, and yet we've got quite a lot of activity before that time. So the system automatically puts that into the uh, into the retained earnings. And that's essentially where those um, values get recorded. So the historical part re recorded into the retained earnings. But needless to say, here we have essentially uh, a GL and let's just go through that again and I'll just see if I can pull up something that might help a little bit more. Let's have a look at the cap gains and the drawings. And so we've got drawings, or maybe, we, sorry, not capital gains, capital introduced. I did think we had more capital, 
capital introduced might have gone to share capital. Oh yeah, there you go, share capital. So we've got our share capital and the share capital was introduced for the purposes of purchasing Siemens BMW AXA and Unilever through that quasi bank account. And there is our quasi bank account over here with those being introduced. Now, finally, we have, we have some, there's a couple of other reports in here as well, which I'm not gonna go through, um, but let's just have a look at our cross checks. So we do do a set of cross checks in here as well. And those cross checks are there just to ensure that um, we don't have any issues with things like net assets meeting and equaling um, the equity. And there's other things in here, like for instance, the realized gains and losses matching. But essentially in this, in this case, all of the, all of the reporting um, values that we track all balance and match and cross, cross check. So we're, we're confident that our reports are accurate. So now what am I doing is changing this over to cost. I'll save that. And then I will up, upload that changed file. Uh, test file. So hopefully that will upload and replace it. And then I will go to I'll go back, I'll go back to my OneDrive Explorer. And don't forget, I'm using that robust test. Now, this time when I invoke it, I should be running it as at cost, right? So let's give that a moment to chug through the data set. And Hopefully we'll get an at cost set of reports. So it should be just about there. It's not a big data set, so it shouldn't take long at all. But you can see it's still working away. On a big data set, it is pretty slow. So um, here we are, right? So what do we really want to see here? We want to see, did our investment report just generate at cost? So everything should be at cost cost there's no market value conversions so there's opening so we should see everything so if we let's let's just have a look at something like Unilever 100 Unilever 27 euro which is total of 2700 euro is it and then 4000 so that's an opening opening value just converted at opening value date right uh, no, it should just be always at cost, but with that conversion rate, and if we have a look, we should see that's pretty much our closing as well. Yeah, pretty much. So on hand at cost. Now you can see there's no, it's on hand at cost, not on hand at market. And yes, there is a realized gains and losses um, and unrealized market gain there is no market gain right so you can see unrealized market gain none because of course there isn't any market change it's all purely cost but we do have an unrealized forex loss because of course there is still an underlying forex value associated with this and again if we were to look at our on hand at cost converted at balance date 512 let's just see that that's what we have on our balance sheet 500 so it's 512,000 final balance sheet and there's our 512 